So here I am at probably the worst school in the country, whose alumni are nothing but arms dealers, serial killers, and corporate lawyers. Real scum. And that old creep thinks he can tame me? We shall see, my friend. I only give people what they have coming to them. Ah, bully. And what's becoming a weird trend for my channel, I was feeling nostalgic for a game I haven't touched in over a decade. Again. Maybe it's the crushing existential dread of getting older and longing for the halcyon days of my youth. Or the fact Rockstar refuses to make anything but GTA V. But I miss the 2000s era of gaming, when developers were willing to take more chances with new ideas instead of rehashing the same garbage every year. Bully is something of an oddity for Rockstar. Especially modern Rockstar that has a reputation for a bloated world and insane attention to details in games. Coming off the success of the GTA trilogy on PS2, it was kind of weird to see them make what amounts to a PG-13 version of GTA. They switched to a teenage protagonist, removed the over-the-top violence, and changed the setting to a boarding school. On the surface, it looked like Rockstar was really limiting themselves, but it gave them the opportunity to try something different, a more focused and linear game that would end up becoming a cult classic. So join me as I go back and revisit one of my favorite games on the PS2. Though in this case I'll be playing the updated Scholarship Edition on PC, which wasn't the best choice as I found out during my recording. Scholarship Edition added better graphics, more missions, more characters, more classes, and new costumes. But the PC version has quite a few bugs and issues. Mostly with cutscenes, graphics, crashes, and sounds. So basically everything. So before I could actually start playing this version, I had to download and install the fan-made Silent Bully patch that fixed most of these problems. So I'll try to avoid commenting on any technical problems as that has more to do with the shoddy port job than the game itself. The game begins with our lead, Jimmy Hopkins, being dropped off by his mom at Bullworth Academy. She's getting ready for her honeymoon with her fourth husband, and isn't in the mood to babysit her somewhat problematic son. Jimmy reminds me a lot of Tommy Versetti, the main character of GTA Vice City. A thug who has no problem speaking his mind and who's only really out for himself. He's pretty unlikable, but Jimmy isn't a complete asshole like Tommy, and does have a conscience. While he's quick to pick a fight with authority and snap back at other students, he won't go out of his way to bully other kids. Only if I make him. And for the most part, as problems arise in the story, he does put in the effort to try and talk it out before choosing violence. After the intro, I take control of Jimmy and make my way to the headmaster's office. As Jimmy heads into school, several kids start following him around and trying to beat him up. At first I thought this was a glitch, but then I remembered most of the cliques will try and pick a fight with Jimmy before he improves his reputation with them. In this case, the kids following him on the way to the office are the bullies. They're not really a clique and more a loose group of idiotic thugs. Other than Jimmy, you'll see them bully various students throughout the game. In the main office, we meet the headmaster of Bullworth Academy, Dr. Crabblesnitch. He lays into Jimmy, reading off his rap sheet, and basically telling him to keep out of trouble. He's stern, but not an outright asshole. More or less what you'd expect of someone trying to instill discipline in his students and trying to reform them. I remember when I first saw Crabblesnitch, I assumed he'd end up being the main villain, constantly butting heads with him throughout the story, kind of like John Bender and Dick Vernon or Principal Skinner and Bart Simpson, but he mostly stays out of the plot and doesn't really go out of his way to antagonize Jimmy unless he's gotten himself into trouble. Where's your uniform, young Hopkins? Run along now, child. Chapter 1 officially starts here, and Jimmy will have to head over to the boys' dormitory in order to change into a school uniform. Now we're introduced to the game's trouble meter, the equivalent to GTA's star system. It's divided into three segments, slowly filling up as Jimmy breaks the rules, like beating up other students, running around without his uniform, or when he's cutting class. If an authority figure like a prefect, teacher, or policeman spots Jimmy while he's rule breaking, they'll give chase and try to grapple him down to the ground. If your meter is in the yellow, you can fight back and escape, but if it's in the red, you get busted instantly. Depending on when, where, and by who Jimmy's busted by, he'll either be sent to the class he's skipping, his dorm, the police station, or the principal's office. Get busted three times while class is in session, and Jimmy will end up in detention where he's forced to do some menial task. He'll also have any weapons he had on him confiscated. 
It's an interesting system and nowhere near as escalating or sometimes overwhelming like GTA Star system, but it feels more like a nuisance than something to be generally worried about. Your trouble meter will start to go down the second you're out of an authority figure's field of view, and running into a building is usually an easy way to ditch the person chasing you, though Jimmy can easily outrun them for the most part. Making it to his dorm, Jimmy is greeted by a trio of bullies, and we get a tutorial to the game's combat system. It's a more expanded version of the combat you had in San Andreas. You'll lock into an enemy with the corresponding button to take a fighting pose, being able to block hits while holding the lock on. You can combo punches, grapple your opponents, or move them around towards something like a garbage can to toss them in. And finally, humiliating them with a finisher. You can also humiliate random students by giving them a wedgie or pinching a girl's butt. Though if you bully younger students or girls, your trouble meter will instantly head into the red. I think the combat is fine, even if it can be very clunky at times, especially when you're fighting multiple opponents. Later on, Jimmy will be able to unlock more moves he can use in fights that make it much easier to take down opponents. After beating the bullies and eating a sucker punch from their leader, Russell, Jimmy enters the dorm and meets Gary Smith. Hey, you're the new kid. Yeah, what's it to you? Friendly, aren't you? Give me a break, loser. Hey, relax, friend. You're all pent up. Go easy or they put you on medication. They did to me. Boy, you nearly sent me insane. That's fascinating. Now if you'll excuse me. I said me. relax, friend. Get off, man. Listen to me, tough guy. You just arrived at the toughest school in the country, and I'm offering to be your friend. Trust me, in a place like this, you're going to need friends. So it's up to you. You're going to play nice or what? Yeah, sure. Good. So how about I show you around? Gary is Jimmy's first friend, and I say that with quotations as the second he begins speaking and introduces himself, you know he's scheming something. Gary is a sociopath with no empathy for others, a narcissist who considers himself above everyone around him and dreams of ruling the school. Despite Jimmy being somewhat apprehensive of Gary at first, he still takes him up on his offer of friendship. As Jimmy has already experienced how rough Bullworth is within 10 minutes of being here, sure hope he doesn't come to regret that later. After donning his school uniform, Jimmy meets his second friend at Bullworth, Peter Kowalski, or Petey as everyone calls him. Petey is quiet and timid, and an outcast like Gary and Jimmy. To quote Petey himself, he's too cool to be a dork, and too dorky to be anything else. A real in-betweener, if you will. His awkwardness and inability to stand up to others just lands him at the bottom of the social hierarchy in a dog-eat-dog -dog environment like Bullworth. And unfortunately, that just leaves him as a punching bag for Gary. After the boys are done with the pleasantries, Jimmy returns to school and gets a guided tour of the place from his new psycho buddy. Gary will introduce us to some side characters, but more importantly, introduces the four main cliques of the story. First are the nerds, who are fairly self-explanatory being the dorky, smart kids with bad social skills and worse hygiene. The preppies, the rich and privileged kids at school, your typical snobby kids and most who are products of incest apparently. Gotta keep the bloodline pure, I guess. The greasers, 1950s throwbacks with leather jackets, slick hair, and a love of cars and bikes. And in an obvious reference to the outsiders, sworn enemies with the preppies. And finally, the jocks, the athletes and popular kids at the school mostly consisting of the football team and cheerleaders, and of course, sworn enemies of the nerds. Each clique tends to have a place in school that is considered their turf, with the nerds in the library, the preppies in their own private dorm, the greasers in the auto repair shop, and the jocks in the gym and football field. While the cliques have specific rivals, they do tend to hassle the members of other groups as well, and you'll occasionally see fights break out between them when wandering around. After the tour, Gary and Jimmy will get in trouble for goofing around and be sent to class. The first class is chemistry, and it's nothing particularly special, just hitting the right button at the right time to finish the minigame. Successfully passing the class will unlock the chemistry set in Jimmy's room, letting him create fireworks and eventually more items as he passes more chemistry classes. Other than his first class, all classes are technically optional. You'll have two classes each day, one in the morning and the other in the afternoon. The subjects are chemistry, English, art, gym, shop, and photography, with the scholarship edition adding math, geography, biology, and music. 
Each one has a different mini game or objective to them, and more subjects are unlocked as you progress the game. Despite being optional, you do get some unlockables for attending class and being a good student. Besides the weapons you can craft by passing chemistry, English will allow you to better talk your way out of trouble, art will let you kiss girls for a health bonus, gym will unlock more combos and increase weapon accuracy, shop will unlock bikes you can ride around the town with, and photography improves the quality of photos you take. The four new classes that were added to the game unfortunately only really unlock more clothing, though geography will mark collectibles on the map for you the more classes you pass. For a game that's set in a school, it's weird to see the classes barely get any focus, but your various teachers will have story missions associated with them throughout the game. After class, the game's time system will kick in. Jimmy's day starts when he wakes up at 8am each day, the clock ticking away throughout most missions. Outside of Jimmy's class schedule, story missions will only be available during certain times of day. Classes end at 3.30 and night begins at 7pm, with the main school building accessible but being patrolled by prefects who will send Jimmy back to his dorm if they catch him. Curfew is 11pm, with shops in town being closed and police on patrol to bust anyone breaking curfew. And finally, Jimmy can't stay up past 2am, so he'll drop like a log wherever he is and wake up back in his room. Not quite sure how Jimmy got back there on his own, but it's most likely there so you have a chance to make it to your morning class on time. I don't really have much to say about the clock. It moves fast enough where I don't feel like I'm standing around trying to kill time for a mission to unlock, and outside of instantly failing a mission if Jimmy stays up past 2am, it isn't really all that inconvenient. The next story mission starts outside of school, with Dr. Crabblesnitch lecturing Jimmy about the fights he's already gotten in. Jimmy of course explains that he only got into fights because of all the bullies in school, but the headmaster dismisses the bullying as just being school spirit, and something pretty common when he was a student. School officials ignoring bullying and only interfering when the victim fights back? A bit too realistic, don't you think, Rockstar? Afterwards, a bully will call Jimmy a teacher's pet and shoot him with a slingshot before running away. After kicking his ass, I unlocked a slingshot and gained some respect with the nerds. Now's a good time to get into the respect system. It's your standing with the various clicks in the school. Your reputation going up or down with certain clicks after completing certain missions. How high your reputation with a click is will determine how hostile they are to you when you're around them, and eventually whether they'll back you up in fights. It feels really inconsequential though, since you don't have any real way to affect your individual standing with them outside of story missions. So you're basically put on a linear path of which groups will and won't be cool with Jimmy. Maybe if the respect system was built around doing side quests and favors for the group, and you got some cool unlocks for getting him to max level. Admittedly, it would probably pad the game out if you had to grind reputation to unlock story missions, but at least it would have more of a reason for existing. The next mission serves as a tutorial to using the slingshot, with Gary talking Jimmy into shooting at the football team with it. The slingshot has infinite ammo and when aiming can be held down to do more damage to others. It's nothing particularly special, but it does feel like a get out of jail free card in certain tough fights. While it doesn't do massive damage, if you're getting your ass kicked, it's easy to play keep away and just chip away at someone in order to win. Though the game is smart enough to catch this, as there are certain scripted fights where Jimmy loses his weapons. After goofing around and barely passing English class, my next mission has Gary talking Jimmy into attacking the homeless. It goes about as well as you expect. The rumors are true, Jimmy. Your dad does live on campus. Oh, you jerk! Ow! Let's leave this guy to his welfare payments! Come on, let's get out of here! After apologizing to the hobo, we learn he's a Korean War veteran, and for some reason is allowed to live on school grounds next to kids. It's alluded through some NPC dialogue that he may have been a former teacher at the school, but it's never outright confirmed. The hobo will offer to teach Jimmy some fighting moves he learned in the war, if he brings him a transistor. The first one being handed to you for this mission. While I wouldn't call the combos essential, it does make some of the tougher fights easier, as you'll be able to knock down your enemies with kicks, or do more damage depending on the move used. It's odd that you would go collect transistors for him, as you would think a drunk hobo would only want booze. What's he doing with those transistors anyway? <laughs> Take this! Ah, well that's certainly something. The remainder of this chapter focuses on Jimmy getting in the good graces of the nerds, 
Our first proper intro with the nerds is in helping one of their members, Algernon. Or Algy as everyone calls him. It's basically an escort mission, as you need to keep bullies from attacking him as you walk him to his locker. Next, you'll be assisting the only female member of the nerds, Beatrice. Give it back! Or what? Or, well, just give it back! Are you threatening me, Metal Mouth? No, I just, just give it back! You can't just steal things from me! <laughs> Unfortunately for you, my pig ugly friend, that is exactly what I can do. In fact, I can do anything I like in this place. Anything at all. Ciao, spotty. The poor girl has her notes stolen by the bitchy cheerleader, Mandy. Jimmy to the rescue. He breaks into Mandy's locker in the gym, gets the notes back, and earns himself a kiss from Beatrice, now landing her as a girlfriend. I like Beatrice. She's really cute and dorky, and probably one of the few genuinely nice characters you'll meet in the game. Too bad she really isn't that important to the plot. As the game goes on, Jimmy will slowly build a harem of girls, usually landing the sole female member of each clique. But outside of the health boost you get from kissing them, they don't really do much else, which I think is a wasted opportunity. In San Andreas, you could find various women to date, most found by exploring the map and needing to have a certain type of appearance in order to approach them. You take them out on various dates, raise their affection, and get some type of bonus or unlockable for dating them. So while not essential or necessary, at least they felt worth pursuing. After protecting another nerd from bullies, I can unlock the skateboard. It's okay, I can't go upstairs and it slows down on grass and snow, but it's convenient since it's always in your inventory. Unlike bikes where you'll have to go out of your way to steal one or run over to a garage. Now's a good time to knock out one more mechanic in the game, errands. During gameplay, NPCs will rush to Jimmy with a blue arrow dangling over them, needing him to do a favor for them. The errands vary depending on the NPC and can be as simple as a delivery, performing a task like smashing a car, or walking a girl back to her dorm. Successfully completing an errand will usually reward you with some money or a few items. On the topic of money, I want to get this out of the way before returning to the story. But money feels too abundant and nowhere near as useful like in GTA. Every story mission tends to reward a decent amount of cash, but there isn't really anything useful to spend it on. Ammo for your weapons, soda for your health, and gifts for your girlfriends are dirt cheap and barely put a dent in your wallet. Money will mostly be spent on clothing for Jimmy, and that's about it. There are some extras like the carnival, or buying bikes from the bike shop, though they're worse than the ones unlocked in shop class. This ends up making the part-time jobs Jimmy can take on later feel pointless, as you'll never be in need of a huge amount of money. I wouldn't call it an outright missed opportunity as Jimmy's age, the setting, and the lack of lethal weapons definitely limited what they could do with cash. So admittedly, I'd rather have a problem with too much money and nothing to buy, than the opposite problem like in, say, GTA 5. Alright then, back to the story. Continuing our support of the nerds, the next mission has you assist the head of their clique, Ernest, in running for school president. And he looks awfully familiar. Hey y'all, Scott here. Jimmy will have to guard him as he's giving a speech, sniping at anyone trying to attack him by using the slingshot. Mission complete, Jimmy earns the sniper upgrade for the slingshot, and rather annoyingly, we have zero idea who ends up winning the class election, since it's never brought up again. The main story with the nerds is finished for now, and outside of two optional missions with them, the game will now skip ahead to Halloween. Hey, what's going on? Not much. I was just lying here wishing I could be more like you. As you can tell by Jimmy's costume, our next mission is to go out and beat up that new kid, Daniel LaRusso. <laughs> Just kidding. On Gary's advice, we gotta go out and commit some pranks. Also, Gary has quite the, uh, questionable costume on tonight. First half of the night has us taking students' requests to perform certain pranks. The second half of the night gives us the mission, The Big Prank. Now this is a lot more fun, as Gary and Jimmy will feed some rancid meat to one of the preppy's dogs. They'll then collect his poop in a paper bag, light it on fire outside Mr. Burton's office, and wait for him to come out. Out of control. <laughs> poop again. He caught the shit poop. 
There you are. Come on, I found something incredible. Hold on. Relax, man. I can't keep getting in trouble. I can't get expelled again. It's always about me with you. Me, me, me. The next day has Jimmy finding Gary in the common room acting weird. Well, more weird than usual. He sounds extremely anxious, and maybe a little desperate as he wants to get Jimmy involved in something he's found. Jimmy's trying his best to resist Gary, but ultimately gets looped into yet another scheme of his. Gary will lead him to the school's basement, and I have to say I really enjoy this mission. It's more of a puzzle as Jimmy will have to hit switches to unlock doors, either crawling under a fence to get to one, hitting it with his slingshot, or knocking over a broom so it hits the switch and also putting out a furnace with a fire extinguisher so that a pipe it's connected to stops shooting out steam. I also appreciate that the game doesn't just tell you what to do here, and you'll have to figure out what to do next. The broom puzzle, for example, took me a few minutes to figure out. Though, if you take too long, Gary will get impatient and just spell it out for you. Leading us down into the hole, Gary does the unthinkable. Betray Jimmy. I am shocked! Shocked! Well, not that shocked. Okay, let's be honest here, from the second we met the guy, it was 100% obvious he was going to betray us somewhere down the road. And at first, it felt a little weird that he did it so early into the game, right at the end of chapter 1. But this is perfectly in line with his character. Gary only thinks of himself, and was planning to use Jimmy as a tool on his ascension to being king of the school. But since Jimmy was constantly giving him pushback and didn't just crumble from his verbal abuse like Petey, and in fact dished it back quite often, Gary most likely saw Jimmy betraying him first sooner or later, so while weird narratively, it does make sense from Gary's perspective. He traps Jimmy in the pit, and gathers all the heads of the other cliques in order to watch Russell beat Jimmy to a pulp. Cue a boss battle. Befitting his Hulk-like demeanor, Russell can be insanely tough, especially if you didn't go out of your way to learn a few moves from the hobo first. He soaks up quite a bit of damage, Jimmy's hits barely scratch him, and any weapons you have on hand barely dent him either. Russell is your traditional bullfight boss, charging at Jimmy head first in order to smash him into the walls for a decent amount of damage. The goal is to outrun and dodge his charge so he smashes his head into the pit to stun himself and open himself up for damage. Oof, that can't be good for his already questionable intelligence. You happy now, jerk? Ecstatic! I love to watch two morons beat the crap out of each other. Why'd you do it, Gary? I thought we were friends. <laughs> Friends? You and me. I've taken dumps that had more brains than you, friend. No. I'm taking over this school, and you're just a liability. See you around, moron! After toppling Russell, Gary loudly declares his plan to rule the school. Remember this for later. And officially ends his friendship with Jimmy. Jimmy makes friends with the slow-witted giant and convinces him to stop bullying weaker kids bringing chapter one to an end. So I want you to leave me and him alone. Oh, okay. Sorry. Bad Russell. With Russell pacified, I could be forgiven for thinking my troubles at Bullworth were over. But this place is a rotten onion. Peel off one stinking layer, and there's another even smellier one beneath. Chapter two is focused on dealing with the preppies. The chapter begins with Dr. Crabblesnitch talking to Jimmy about rumors saying he fought in the school's basement and some things he said about the headmaster himself. Naturally, as we all know, Gary's behind it all, and despite proclaiming his innocence, the headmaster reminds Jimmy to behave himself and instructs him to go help the lunch lady, Edna. Immediately after the headmaster leaves, a preppy will approach Jimmy and invite him to Old Bullworth Bale Boxing Gym after hearing how he beat up Russell. Before I can start dealing with the preppies, I have to take care of two missions with the school faculty first. First, I start by helping the math teacher, Mr. Galloway. After an argument he's had with another teacher, Mr. Hattrick, about the former's blatant drunkenness on the job, Galloway asks Jimmy to find the bottles he's stashed in school and give them to the art teacher, Miss Phillips. Once we're done covering for his alcoholism, we help the lunch lady Edna by running out to town and getting some things for her upcoming date. I probably could have visited the town in Chapter 1, but this is the first mission that actually needs me to go out there. Bullworth, the town that is, is decently sized and divided up into six districts. It's filled with the adult residents of town, and you'll see students from school wandering around as well, with cliques usually sticking to certain parts of town. This is also where the fifth clique, the townies, hang out. 
Townies are the teenagers who don't attend Bullworth for whatever reason, either having dropped out, been expelled, or unable to afford the tuition. But for now though, they're mostly unimportant to the story. Outside of the shops where you can buy ammunition and gifts for your girlfriends, there's also barbershops to change Jimmy's hairstyle, along with some clothing stores. In terms of what to do in town, the further you get into the story, you'll unlock racing missions, the previously mentioned part-time jobs, and there's even a carnival to go to where you can collect tickets to buy prizes. Each area has a bus stop that will let you quick travel back to school, but annoyingly, there's no way to quick travel back to any places in town. After gathering in this stuff, a new red star appears on the map, leading us to the boxing gym the preppies mentioned earlier. This is a challenge mission. Challenge missions are slightly different than story missions and involve challenging the cliques for ownership of their hangouts. After you beat them, you'll unlock a new place to save and sleep, along with an arcade game to play. In order to win the gym from the preppies, we won't have to challenge them to the noble art of boxing. Cue a montage. They welch on giving up the gym though, giving me their beach house instead. Still not half bad. Before I can do the next mission though, I do have to look a little more presentable. The preppy Tad requiring me to buy the same crappy sweater his click wears. After dressing like a conformist, we head off to egg Mr. Hattrick's house for attempting to fire Mr. Galloway. The preppies basically just want to defend Galloway's right to drink on the job, which admittedly I respect. There's probably some kind of rich person joke in there I'm not getting, but whatever. Whatever, Tad. Your family is your business. Don't lie, Jimmy. You said Tad was probably a hermaphrodite with that much inbreeding. A hermaphro what? Don't act dumb. You said his mom was also legally his aunt and that he probably had webbed toes. I don't. Well, just only on one foot. Unfortunately, before they get to hit Hattrick's house, Gary shows up out of nowhere, claiming Jimmy was talking a lot of shit about Ted's family. Despite Gary's reputation and proclaiming his desire to rule the school, they fall for it, and Jimmy has to fight his way out of Tad's yard and escape. Heading back to town, Jimmy stops by the movie theater and meets the preppy's female member, Pinky. Hey, Jimmy Hopkins. Do I know you? No, I'm Pinky, but I know all about you. Everybody's talking about you. Everybody says that you're mean and angry and you like fighting. Huh. Gary said you're so mad because you're sexually confused. Yeah, well, Gary talks a lot of crap. Pinky is cordial, if stuck up like the rest of her rich friends. She's engaged to her cousin and leader of the preppies, Darby. Gross, but again, keeping the bloodline pure. I'm not saying I approve, I'm just saying I sort of get it. Sort of. She'll have Jimmy clear the line so she can get some good seats, and returning later with some flowers, Jimmy will take her out on a date to the carnival. Hey Pete, where is everybody? Oh Jimmy. It's you. Yeah? Guess you want to kill Gary now that he's turned most of school against you and got those rich kids to throw eggs at you. Gary will get what's coming to him. What's wrong with you? Nothing. The following mission has Jimmy finding Petey all bummed out in the dorms, depressed that Gary and Jimmy parted ways, in his eyes losing his only friends. Though Petey isn't completely delusional and acknowledges how much of an asshole both his friends are, Jimmy tries to cheer him up and the pair head down to the beach for a bike race with the preppies. The race isn't tough and it's just one long lap around the area, but good god it's brutal on my thumb. After winning, the bike shop owner will give Jimmy a nice little trophy for his trouble. Too bad the preppies are sore losers and run off with it. After stomping the preppies with some help from a greaser, the next mission has Jimmy looking to get revenge on Tad for listening to Gary. I'm sorry, I'm sorry! Think I'm dumb? <laughs> Who's dumb now? I'm dumb, I'm dumb, real dumb! Hey, hey kid, hey kid, help me out, please! Easy, Russell! <laughs> calm down, calm down! <laughs> Sit! <laughs> good boy! Thank you, thank you! Jeez, that dumb kid's really strong! Dumb? Hey, be good! No! Be good! After saving the Yum Yum Market owner from getting beat up from Russell, he gives Jimmy some eggs and fills him in on the fancy party Tad's dad is throwing. With Russell backing him up this time, they head back to Tad's place and crash the party. Jimmy will fill the windows with eggs as Russell guards him. 
and despite all his efforts, the preppies don't seem any closer to submitting to Jimmy. A little bit later, we meet with Petey on the pier, and we ask him for some advice. He suggests taking out their toughest guy, Biff. Hopeful the show of strength will show they don't stand a chance against Jimmy. Time to put the gloves back on. Me! Who's the toughest? Me! Who's the man? Me! Me, losers! Me! The champion number one! I killed the best! I will beat the rest! Unfortunately, despite kicking his ass, it's still not enough, as the remaining preppies refuse to submit. They decide to band together and fight Jimmy instead, the 1% yet again stomping on the 99% or some kind of allegory like that, I don't know. This is another boss battle, the main target being the leader of the preppies, Darby. He's not as tough as Russell, but makes up for it by summoning waves of his goons, hiding behind a counter while they fight Jimmy before jumping into the fight himself. If things get a bit rough, some of the goons will drop soda to heal Jimmy and help him survive the onslaught. With Darby defeated, he submits and declares Jimmy their boss, bringing an end to chapter two. Who's the boss now? I can't hear you, rich kids! Who's the boss now, my waspy little friend? Answer the question! You are... Louder! You are... Uh... That's right! Me! Now you girls, learn to play nice, you understand? Now, Darby is really stupid, malevolent, and rich. So it will surprise none of you to discover in a future life, he'll end up in Congress. But this is my story, not his. With the trust fund babies under control, it's time to turn my attention to their sworn enemies, those greaseball kids. Chapter 3 skips ahead a few months, taking us to winter, with snow covering Bullworth. This chapter will mainly be focused on the greasers. While Jimmy and Pete celebrate the former's win over the preppies, they're interrupted by a greaser, whose boss, Johnny Vincent, requires Jimmy's help. Jimmy Hopkins, right? My friend Johnny needs your help. Then tell your friend Johnny to come and ask for it. Nobody tells Johnny anything. Johnny Vincent does the telling. Well, he doesn't tell me what to do. Now beat it, greaseball. You're causing an oil slick. I said he needs your help, man. Do I look like a charity service? You're gonna pay for this. What is wrong with this place? Jimmy is really antagonistic here, rebuffing and insulting the guy, telling him he isn't interested in helping anyone before the greaser leaves. The guy was mostly cordial and wasn't really being all that demanding sounding concerned about his boss. So Jimmy basically biting the guy's head off and telling him to take a hike seems unwarranted. Maybe the power is starting to get to his head. Before dealing with the greasers, I end up taking care of some side missions first. First is Edna, continuing on to the next part of her upcoming date, getting her some perfume, chocolates, and sedatives for some reason. Next is helping out her future date, the chemistry teacher, Mr. Watts. He's got a grudge against Darby and his father for owning the same rare plant that he does, for some reason. So he tasks Jimmy with disguising himself as a preppy, sneaking into their private dorm, and using weed killer to kill the rare plant. It probably feels out of place here in chapter 3, but this was an optional mission I still had left over from chapter 2. I also take the time to kick the nerds out of their hideout underneath the comic book shop by getting the high score in a sumo arcade game. Now, unlike the original bully, in the scholarship edition, I have to take care of some Christmas-themed side missions before I unlock the first mission with the greasers. So I head over to the rundown part of Bullworth known as New Coventry. There, in a back alley, I find a drunk and down-on-his-luck hobo Santa named Rudy. Hey, 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 kid! You got a light? No. Okay, then you want to sit on my knee? You want to kick in the balls? Uh, I'm sorry, kid. Looking so pitiful, I decide to help him regain his Christmas spirit. First by tossing snowballs at some townies who had harassed him. Then by ruining Christmas for another Santa and his elves. And finally by rounding up some of my schoolmates to sit on his lap and take some photos with Santa. Really, really hope I don't have to turn these over to the FBI. Finally, I can have a proper meeting with the leader of the Greasers, Johnny Vincent. So you came? Yup. 
I bet you think I'm funny, don't you? A laughing stock? Not really. I mean, you dress a little weird, but... Yeah? And everyone is laughing at me. All of you, at me! What are you talking about? Don't play dumb with me. Have you had her? Who are you talking about? I bet you have. Have you had what her? What are you doing? Who? Lola! That slut! That slut I love. No, man! Johnny is frustrated as he thinks his girlfriend Lola has been unfaithful and cheating on him, specifically with a preppy named Gord. So he enlists Jimmy's help in getting some proof, having him follow the pair around and snap some photos proving she's unfaithful. Proof in hand, Johnny wants revenge on Gord for ruining his relationship, and Jimmy lures him back to the Greaser's hideout for some well-deserved payback. It's less a brutal brawl though, and more a bunch of kids jousting and throwing stuff at each other from their bikes. Returning back to the academy and entering the library, Ernest fills us in that Johnny is getting more and more paranoid since Lola's infidelity has been exposed. Ernest is particularly worried about Algie, who some people have spotted with Lola, so I'm off to find him before Johnny drags him behind his bike, and also to give him a ton of high fives. Nice one, Algie. Lola's a babe. Rumors spread fast, as the Greasers will be attacking nerds all over campus in search of algae. After saving some nerds, they point me in the direction of New Coventry. Damn, algae. Meeting with Lola right in the Greasers' turf? Talk about having some balls. Arriving there, I find Lola with another preppy and algae. As it turns out, she was using both of them. For their money and homework, respectively. After Lola leaves pissed off, we help the guys get out of there before the Greasers tear them to shreds. I should probably point out by now that a good chunk of story missions involving a click usually makes of my reputation with them worse and not better. It only bounces back into the positive when I beat their click leader and the chapter ends. So again, the reputation system seems rather pointless. Back at school, the preppies aren't too keen that the greasers are still harassing Gord, so they pressure their boss, Jimmy, to take revenge. In this case, Jimmy running around their turf and tagging the place up with spray paint. Afterwards, he further puts the screws to the greasers by beating them up and taking their clubhouse. And, a little while later, I'll find Johnny and Lola arguing in the streets. Of course I love you, Johnny! No, you don't. Love is complicated. That didn't seem complicated between you and that Gordo kid. I'm gonna kill him! Johnny, please! We've been over that. He's sweet, but it was so innocent. Get off! Oh, I love it when you get angry, Johnny. I really do. You're so... Bestial. Johnny is trying to finally end the relationship, but Lola is using her charms to try and get him to forgive her instead. Don't do it, Johnny. Don't be a simp. She soon gets a different idea after spotting Jimmy, pitting both boys against each other in a bike race for her love. And after leaving Johnny in the dust, Jimmy adds Lola to his harem. Honestly, I don't know what the hell Jimmy is thinking here. He's seen firsthand how disloyal Lola is and how obsessed Johnny is over her. I'm sure this won't end well. At all. Before continuing the Greaser's plot, it's time to help Edna through her date. Knowing how shitty the kids in Bullworth are, she wants Jimmy to take care of any troublemakers that might interrupt her date. Though maybe it was better I didn't, as during her date, Edna ends up drugging Mr. Watt, taking the unconscious man to the nearby hotel, to do things to him, without his consent. You know, if the genders were a verb, back to the Greaser's storyline, Lola is upset because everyone in her clique turned on her for, you know, cheating on her boyfriend and hooking up with Jimmy. Pouting, she works her charms and manages to get Jimmy to break into her old hangout in order to get her stuff back. Jimmy, you dumbass, do you ever learn? Jimmy breaks in and searches for her belongings, beating up anyone in his way. Unfortunately, there are certain areas that are walled off, making it impossible to get to Lola's things. Even worse, I got another boss battle this time against Norton. Whoa, whoa, what are you doing here? Um, uh, taking out the trash. Looks like that's what I have to do. I just love wrecking things with my hammer. Who's rocking a fucking sledgehammer? This one is a tough fight, as Norton soaks up damage, can't be downed, and you know, is using a sledgehammer. You have to play keep away, letting him tire himself out before rushing in for some shots. But he recovers fast, so it's best to get like three hits in before running away. Or else it's hammer time. After taking him out, I get his hammer to use to break through those walls from before, and get the last of Lola's belongings. 
Jimmy's actions, and essentially playing both sides, has caused the preppies and the greasers to get into a massive brawl. Man, if only it was as cool as that scene. Well, it's less Jimmy's fault and more Lola's, as she's basically put the groups against each other, with either Gord or Johnny winning her heart if their click wins. Despite Jimmy instigating a good chunk of this fight, he wants to try and break it up before someone ends up dead. New Coventry is littered with brawls between both groups, and Jimmy will have to fight his way through them in order to find Johnny and put an end to things. After outrunning the cops, Jimmy is cornered and has to fight Johnny where he rides around on his bike and attacks him. Seemingly out of nowhere, Petey shows up and offers to help Jimmy, telling him he can use the magnetic crane to grab Johnny's bike. The goal now is to take out the greasers blocking his path, hitting them with any long-range weapons you have and dodging Johnny's swipes as best he can. Once Petey makes it to the crane, I lead Johnny under it to get him off his bike and make him a complete pushover. Johnny then submits, and Jimmy reminds him he took down his whole gang, conquering yet another click as the chapter comes to an end. I told you, I was the daddy. Got it? I'm in charge. You do what I said. All right, I give up. You can have her. Who? What are you talking about, Johnny? Lola, you win. She's yours. This has nothing to do with her, man. I don't care. You can keep that slut for yourself. What? You don't want her? Then why did you do this? Why'd you fight? Just to prove you're tougher than me? That's right. And don't you or your boys forget it. I'm tougher than you, so maybe now you'll stop bullying everyone. You work for me now. Oh, man. I'm starting to feel pretty good about myself. I've just taken control of two of the school's worst cliques, but I know there are bigger problems just around the corner. Problems with overdeveloped pituitary glands and brains the size of peas. Chapter 4 skips us ahead into spring, and this time around, we're tackling both the nerds and the jocks. Jimmy and Petey are hanging out, with Jimmy busting the kids' chops, and Petey making a seriously awkward male stripper joke. Real funny, Jimmy. Well, when you're done with this place, a career on the stage awaits. Maybe, maybe like a male stripper or something, huh? What? <clears throat> so, um, what about Gary? During their conversation, Petey reminds Jimmy that Gary is still out there, scheming and whatnot. Sure would be great to see the main villain actually show up every now and then. The pair end up butting heads with some jocks, setting Jimmy's eyes on his next target. Or not, as we got some nerds to put in their place first. Heading to the library, we find Algie acting like a dick to our best pal Petey. We ask him for some help from the nerds against the jocks, but he really gets up his own ass and acts like he's beneath helping Jimmy. Us help you? Yeah, think of everything I've done for you since I got here. You? You're like a bouncer. We're a bit above helping people like you. I mean, get real, duh. Pea stain. You fat asshole. We kept you from getting your face kicked in. I hope you lose your smarts and go back to being an idiot. Get it? Because his name is Algernon? Like in the book? PD advises we remind the nerds who's in charge and suggests we take down their leader, Ernest. Sounds like a plan. Jimmy fights his way through waves of nerds on his way to the observatory, where Ernest is hiding. Once inside, we engage Ernest in a boss battle. Ernest, what are you doing? Give it up, dork. You work for me now. You're pathetic. You've defeated my weakest compadres. You've just met your match. I want us to be friends. I need your help. I've had friends like you. The kind who treat you like dog muck on their shoes. No thanks, bud. Come on. It's my brains against your brawn. Welcome to hell, Jimmy Hopkins. Ernest obviously can't match Jimmy mano a mano. So instead, he fights him from above using long-range weapons. As he attacks from the catwalk, I'll have to shoot at the machines kipping it up to try and knock him down. Once defeated, he falls in line, and Jimmy recruits his help in fighting the jocks. First step in putting the jocks in their place, taking over the gym. Which of course means dodgeball. Afraid of you, loser brain! We're gonna win, cause we're better! <clears throat> We did it! We won! Continuing our collaboration with the nerds, 
Algy asks for some help in assisting his friends escape the funhouse at the carnival. While at its core, it's basically an escort mission again, it does shake things up for a change. After finding the two nerds, Jimmy will have to guide them out of the funhouse. This involves dodging and disabling some of the attractions, using those same attractions to slow the jocks down, and searching through a small maze to regroup with everyone and find your way out. It's not mind-bending stuff, but a nice change of pace from the usual go here, beat up these guys, and leave missions that make up a good chunk of the game. Next one is different too, as we're doing what amounts to a stealth mission. Ernest here wants some candid photos of Mandy, the head cheerleader. After snapping a photo of her while she's in the gym, I have to enter the girl's dorm. Here's where the stealth part kicks in, as I have to constantly avoid Miss Peabody, the girl's hall monitor. While she doesn't have a huge cone of vision, she's constantly moving around and the path she takes is really inconsistent. So it took a couple tries of being spotted by her and coming back to get the photos of Mandy. Can only imagine what that sicko Ernest is going to do with these. Before dealing with some more nerd and jock drama, it's time to help Miss Phillips and Mr. Galloway. Apparently Galloway has had himself locked up in the Bullworth Asylum in order to deal with his alcoholism. Miss Phillips, however, feels Galloway will end up coming out of that place worse and not better, and asks Jimmy to sneak in and convince Galloway to leave. Admittedly, an asylum does feel a little extreme to deal with an alcohol problem. Imagine you live in Gotham City and got a DUI, and the judge sentences you to Arkham Asylum instead of community service and mandatory AA meetings. So instead of dealing with your demons, you now have to watch out you don't get shanked by the Joker or get your face punched in by Batman when he's dealing with the weekly asylum takeover. And then the experience just turns you into another villain, with a stupidly specific beer gimmick and costume. Also, your real name is David U. Isaacs, because comic book writers have no sense of subtlety. Anyway, this is another stealth mission, and a much longer one, as Jimmy will have to make his way all the way to the asylum, and then climb over the fence. Once inside, he has to creep past the guards and find the room Mr. Galloway is in to get him out. And like before, if he's spotted, Jimmy's kicked out. Though it's much more annoying here as you have to run from the entrance of the asylum back to the tree and then climb it and sneak back in. With Mr. Galloway out, it's back to dealing with the nerds again. They're in deep shit this time as the jocks have found out about the photos they took of Mandy. But instead of having them expelled or arrested, they want to punch their faces in. Which to be fair, they have every right to. But this is a video game where crimes don't have real consequences, so instead Jimmy has to bail the nerds out by holding off the jocks. Cue a turret section. We're not quite done dealing with the consequences of the photos though, as Jimmy finds a depressed Mandy all by herself. Hi. Hey. I know, it's funny. I'm the girl in the dirty pictures, ha ha. What are you talking about? Ugh, don't pretend you don't know. Everybody knows. Knows what? There's posters of me all over town. Oh, those. Now everyone thinks I'm a slut. Great, my parents will be so proud. I'll probably get expelled. Understandably, she's a bit upset about the photos and fills Jimmy in that posters featuring the photos have been placed all over town. Jimmy doesn't confess he was behind them though, but still opts to help by running around town, tearing them down for her, and adding Mandy to his harem. Taking photos of a girl without consent, spreading them around, and then taking them down to win her affection? Sounds like a page straight out of the dentist system. Finally, we're nearing the end of the chapter, as Ernest has come up with a plan to take care of the jocks once and for all. Sabotage the homecoming game. First step, Jimmy has to steal the mascot costume to disguise himself. Next step, he'll need to sneak onto the field and quietly sabotage the footballs with fireworks, pour glue on the bleachers, and toss marbles on the field. Stopping to do this stupid bulwark dance anytime someone stops him. With the game ruined, it's time for a boss battle against the leader of the jocks, Ted Thompson, and the rest of the football team. Who is that Kim? Yeah, who is that Kim? Oh, it's that little Squirt Hopkins. Yeah, that Squirt Hopkins. You're dead, Hopkins. Yeah, dead, Hopkins. Why don't you stop repeating everything he says and get on with it? Ted is being guarded by several of his teammates while tossing exploding footballs at Jimmy. The goal is to avoid the footballs, toss them back to clear his guards, and then hit Ted when he's exposed. 
Once I clear through several waves of his teammates, Ted goes down from one punch, finally conquering all the clicks in school. That's right, losers! Yeah! <laughs> Oh, Jimmy, you did it! You did it! I'm king of the school! Oh, you beat them all in front of everybody! Thanks for your help, Petey. Oh, this is gonna be great! So here I am, suddenly the king of the school. I never meant for things to turn out this way. I just wanted to control a couple of psycho kids and be left alone. But now I guess I'm certainly going to live the good life. With all the clicks under his thumb, Jimmy is finally king of the school. The chapter begins with him hanging out with all the other click leaders. Their individual grudges seemingly put aside, and all of them basically kissing Jimmy's ass. Clearly absolutely nothing can stop Jimmy now, right? Well, Petey doesn't think so, and warns Jimmy yet again that they still haven't dealt with Gary. Jimmy brushes him off, too busy being caught up in the blind adoration from the other guys. On Tad's suggestion, he tells Jimmy he should leave his mark on the whole town, and talks him into spray painting City Hall. The mission itself is pretty straightforward, and there really isn't anything too special about it. However, while Jimmy was gone, everything went straight to hell. His standing with all the clicks plummet right back to the bottom, as someone has undermined Jimmy's work and turned the clicks against him. Gee, I wonder who could have done that. The rest of the chapter is spent trying to repair the damage that Gary's caused, and try to get the clicks back on Jimmy's side. He'll first have to clear the library of rats for the nerds. Apparently someone loaded a trunk full of old books with the rats that quickly infested the place. Next is saving some jocks and putting out the fire at the gymnasium. Which, Jesus Christ, that's a little much, don't you think, Gary? Well actually, as you put out the fires and rescue your fellow students, you'll spot someone laughing and running out of the building. Hey, what the hell are you doing? Out of my way, schoolboy! I regret nothing! But he doesn't look like Gary. Next is the Greasers. It seems that Johnny Vincent has gone missing, and the rumor is he's been locked up at the asylum. Cue another stealth mission to break him out. And Jesus, it's so much more aggravating this time. Specifically this one part with this guard who's looking back and forth and blocking a hallway. You can't just crouch by him and have to take advantage of a small window while he's not turning to slip past him. But good luck figuring that out. I must have wasted 40 minutes on this one mission alone. Eventually, I managed to make it to Johnny and bust him out. While trying to investigate who's behind everything, Jimmy meets one of the local townies. Zoe. What are you looking at? Nothing. Well, it looks like you're looking at me, scumbag. Like I said, nothing. Oh, come on. I don't want to fight you. My name's Jimmy. Zoe. I was at Bullworth once. I got kicked out. Why? Zoe's voice and attitude remind me a lot of Launch from Dragon Ball. This looks like underwear. Oh no! It's, um, uh, it's Turtle Hermit Fighting Armor! Clever name. Blonde Launch, I mean. Ugh. Okay, boys. Whose idea was this? Wanna dress me like a doll? Well then, please don't forget! The accessory machine gun! She's basically a female version of Jimmy and can dish out trash talk just like he can. Zoe and Jimmy trade barbs for a bit and she fills him in that she was a former student at Bullworth. Turns out that the gym coach Mr. Burton sexually harassed her and when she tried to report him, he got her expelled instead. I didn't mention this earlier, but her claims are definitely true as Mr. Burton had Jimmy go on a panty raid and steal some underwear from the girls dorm earlier in the game. So naturally, Jimmy jumps at the chance to help Zoe when she asks for help in getting revenge on Mr. Burton. He likes to go for a jog in the park around the same time each day and using one of their porta potties. So the plan is simple. Break all the available porta potties to guarantee he uses a specific one and then ram it with a lawnmower to enjoy the fun. Corn for dinner? Oh, this is awful! Oh, 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 yuck! God damn, I stink! I'm gonna have to shower for days 
With bleach! Ah! This is worse than when I got hazed! Now that's what I call a shitty situation. The attack on the clicks is still going on, as Jimmy returns to the boxing gym to find the preppies pissed off as someone has stolen their boxing trophies. They immediately point the finger at the greasers, but Jimmy isn't so sure it's them, and before another brawl can break out, Jimmy will have to get some evidence on who really did it. Heading over to the industrial district with his handy camera, Jimmy manages to snag proof of the real criminals, the townies. And as it turns out, they were also behind the attacks on the other clicks as well. And as Jimmy explains it to the preppies, more than likely Gary is manipulating the townies. Unfortunately, despite the proof, the preppies are still pissed, more or less returning to ignoring Jimmy and refusing to do anything with him. A little bummed, Jimmy goes to see Zoe and the two have a sort of impromptu date, or what two delinquents would consider a date, as they go into the nearby shipping warehouse and compete to see who can smash the most expensive stuff. And despite what you would expect up until this point, Zoe doesn't end up joining Jimmy's harem. Well, not right away anyways. And that's probably why I like her the most out of the girls, as her whole character doesn't revolve around Jimmy. That, and she plays a pretty important role helping out Jimmy throughout the remainder of this chapter. Returning to school, shit has gotten even worse as Jimmy is called to the principal's office. Looks like Gary has been at it again, as he snitched to Dr. Crabble Snitch that Jimmy was the one who defaced the city hall building. The headmaster has no choice but to expel Jimmy, letting him stay on campus until they can reach his mother, but not letting him wear his uniform or attend class. Well, this sucks. Looks like Gary's going to get away with everything. Well, not if Petey has anything to say about it. He pushes Jimmy to fight back against the townies and expose Gary for everything he's done. And after some back and forth, Jimmy agrees. Though before he can rush the townies' turf, he enlists the help of his only remaining friend, Russell. Picking up the big guy from his house, we ride to the abandoned factory where the townies are holding up. Damn! They're locked! Ah! Oh, that's gotta hurt! <laughs> Boom! Uh-oh! This doesn't look so good! Christ, Russell, what the hell are you made of that you tanked an explosion? Unfortunately, despite getting Jimmy inside, he won't be backing him up against the townies, as he takes off once the cops show up. However, Zoe's got Jimmy's back instead. She'll lead us through the factory and unlock gates to help us get in and find the leader of the townies, Edgar. You know, this guy. I regret nothing! Edgar is probably my least favorite of the clique leaders, if only because he's barely fleshed out at all. His whole grudge with Boldworth is that his parents couldn't afford the tuition to send him there, which yeah, that sucks, but dude, that doesn't justify burning down the gym and potentially killing dozens of innocent students. Needless to say, it was easy for Gary to whisper in his ear and manipulate him into fighting the other cliques. But before you can see the error of his ways, Jimmy's gotta kick his ass. Cue a boss battle. It's divided in two parts. The first part having Edgar using a pipe to attack Jimmy while he defends using some metal sheets. After fighting him off, He'll run off and the fight continues with both of them using pipes this time. Because of the damage the pipe does, along with its reach, it's not worth it to try to attack Edgar in any other way. Jimmy is able to block using the pipe, and occasionally during the fight they'll cross pipes like they're in a samurai duel, letting him tap the Y button to break the tie and attack Edgar. Once he's defeated, he fills Jimmy in on how Gary manipulated him, and the two agree to team up to take Gary down. And here we are boys and girls, the final mission of the game. It starts with Jimmy meeting up with Zoe, him just goofing around at first as he tries to proclaim his love to her. But she gets him to knock it off and informs him that all hell has broken loose at the school, as all the cliques have imploded and an all-out war has taken place. Jimmy rushes off to try and restore some order, picking up Russell who had been hiding from the cops, along with Edgar and the townies. Damn, they're locked! Don't worry, Russell will get it! Kind of hurt. Edgar, we'll take out the gang leaders. Without them, Gary's got nothing. The group busts down the gates of Bullworth Academy and get to work trying to restore order. Jimmy will now have to hunt down the click leaders and knock some sense back into them. With all of them taken care of, it's time to take care of Gary. Gary! Moron! Why'd you do it, Gary? Why not? 
I won! I tricked everyone, starting with you, the head, the loser kids in town, and the prefects. Me! I won! You are sad, man. I might be sad, but I've heard your world, moron. And don't you forget it. You did all my dirty work for me, Hopkins. You're like a puppet, only dumber. Whatever. Let's finish this. Jimmy chases him into the school, and both boys start scaling the outside of the building. Once Jimmy catches up to him, both boys fall off the roof and land on some scaffolding, kicking off the final boss fight. And it's pretty underwhelming. Gary doesn't have anything special to his fight, and it basically boils down to your average fight with a regular goon at school, but in a dramatic setting. Though it again fits Gary's character. For all his talk, for all his delusions of grandeur, he really isn't all that tough, having to use others in order to get his dirty work done. Smith! I heard the whole thing! You're expelled! Come and untie me, boy! Yes, sir! <sighs> Sorry, didn't see you there. You know, I think I may have judged you too unfairly, boy. Yes, a little rough around the edges, but you're a diamond, boy. A diamond. Thank you, sir. Now take out the trash, would you, Hopkins? My pleasure. After kicking his ass, both boys smashed through the window ceiling into the headmaster's office, who was apparently tied up during this whole mess. Jimmy finally exposes Gary for everything he's done, getting him expelled, and getting himself reinstated. On top of that, he convinces Dr. Crabblesnitch to let Zoe back in school, to make Petey the head boy, and firing Mr. Burton for sexual harassment. Finally, everything is sorted out, more or less. I mean, I don't want to say we're going to live happily ever after or anything like that, but life is certainly going to get easier. With the day saved, Jimmy rejoins his adoring classmates, and Zoe officially joins his harem. Roll credits. The game officially beaten, it moves on to Chapter 6, Endless Summer. It's essentially a sandbox mode, as it's the player's opportunity to mess around in Bullworth while also completing any side activities and classes they missed during the main story. And that's the game. So what did I think about Bully after all these years? Well, it's certainly not a perfect game, though I never considered it as much. The characters are great, really over-exaggerating the various student stereotypes they represent, though I have my problems with Gary as the main villain, if only because his personality, paranoia, and reputation for backstabbing should never let him get as far as he did. It doesn't help that he very loudly proclaimed his plans to take over the school, in front of all the other clickheads, and not a single one bothered to question him any time and manipulated them against Jimmy. Personally, I think it would have made way more sense for Petey to have been the villain, using Gary as a smokescreen to position himself higher and higher in the school until finally revealing himself at the end. His interactions with Jimmy throughout the game, along with how he's treated as a nobody by just about everybody, makes me feel like the writers might have wanted to go that route. Bullworth Academy itself is done really well, and it feels like it could be any school in America. And while not a totally accurate representation of what school life is like, it does capture that feeling about how much it just sucks to be at school sometimes. Bullies, shitty teachers, stupid click drama. I enjoyed the surrounding town quite a bit as well. Despite being set in the early 2000s, the town has an interesting mix of cultures that makes it feel like it could be part of any decade. Unfortunately, it also feels a little empty, as there aren't many things to do outside of running errands for townspeople or visiting the carnival. The part-time jobs feel like they're supposed to make up for this fact, but as I brought up earlier, the game hands out way too much money, so there isn't much incentive to do the jobs other than 100% completion. Same goes for the other collectibles, that feel more like a checkbox to mark off at the end of a level like a 3D platformer than anything really worth collecting. The missions themselves vary in quality as well, as most really have you repeating the same task of attacking someone or breaking something over and over again, though I still ended up enjoying most of them mainly for the story and characters surrounding the mission, as opposed to the actual objective behind them, which may have been the point. Overall, I'd say my experience revisiting Bully was a positive one. It was great to revisit Bullworth Academy, and in a way, revisit my own high school years. It's been 15 years since the game's release, and a sequel has been rumored for almost as long. And while nothing has been confirmed yet, I'd like to see the game set in Bullworth again. 
Maybe avoid a modern setting with internet and smartphones and make it a prequel in the 90s or 80s. Maybe make the main character customizable, letting you choose your gender and your look, play through all four years of school as opposed to one, and flesh out things like the town, missions, and dating. With Rockstar having shit the bed with the GTA Definitive Trilogy, and no GTA 6 around the horizon yet, now may be a good time to bring back and revive the series. And that's the video. Thanks for watching guys. So this ended up taking much longer than I was planning as unfortunately I ended up getting sick during my recording. I had wanted to get this done before Christmas but yeah, I ended up catching a cold and it really knocked me on my ass so I ended up falling behind. So if my voice sounds a little wonky during this recording, that's pretty much why, as I really, really tried hard to just get this done. So thank you for your patience. I know January is usually that month where most creators kind of take a break, but I want to try and get out a couple more videos, probably smaller ones to make it easier to get done. Also, I just want to say thanks so much for getting us to 200 subs. I wasn't really expecting to reach that milestone by the end of the year, but it was surprising to get there much faster than we did for 100 subs. So, again, thanks so much guys. Let me know what you thought about the video. Did you guys play Bully growing up? Did you like it as much as the GTA games or Red Dead Redemption that followed it? Do you like Jimmy as a protagonist? Or do you feel like he's just a little too cookie cutter? Make sure to give the video a like, comment down below, and if you're new to my channel, I'd appreciate it if you subscribed. This is Fuzzy Slippers, wishing you a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a Happy New Year. Till 2022, I'll see you guys later. Peace.